You're about to hear a brief conversation with an incredible actor. Part autobiographical journey, part literary analysis, and part late night chat in the theatre bar, this is Hear Me Out, and I'm your host, Lucy Eaton. Please welcome to the stage, Patricia Hodge. We had the luck to work together last year, a year ago, and it was just a complete joy, and I absolutely love and respect you, and I'm really excited to talk to you about a John Osborne play. Oh, uh, well, thank you for the intro. Would you like your five pounds now? Yes, I'll take Fine. that. Now, if you could send it over before we finish recording, that would be perfect. <laughs> so you are here today to chat about a speech from The Hotel in Amsterdam, which is by John Osborne. And I am super intrigued as to why you've picked it. And you've been keeping it very mysterious and exciting because it is, in fact, not a speech you have performed yourself and is, in fact, a male character. Yeah. So give us a little background. What is, I don't know the play at all, so I am completely naive. What is The Hotel in Amsterdam about? The plot of The Hotel in Amsterdam is a group of um, actor friends who have been working on a film with a particular director that they all have big issues with. Mm. And uh, they take themselves off for a weekend in Amsterdam to get away from everything. And essentially, it is one of the most, as is often described, it's one of the most inert plays you will ever watch because essentially it's six <laughs> people sitting on sofas talking. Right. There's very, very little action in it. And um, as only John Osborne knows how, the dialogue is enough to hold people riveted by the conversation. I was just about to say that, you know, that's what, for anyone who doesn't know about John Osborne much, that's sort of what he's known for, isn't it? That was what he... Specialised in. Yeah, he specialised yeah. in these sort of kitchen sink. Yes, Di and, and diatribes usually. And it is led by a character called Laurie, mm. who is the most vociferous of them all. You, you would essentially say one of those men that, that has a great line in bitchery <laughs> and anger and so on. What comes out of it is that they, you know, they have a spew a lot of vitriol about this man, but at the end of the day, he obviously is, um, it, you know, you don't waste your hatred on people that aren't worth it. Yeah. And it does, I mean, pe people have traced it back to, it, it's probably all about somebody that John Osborne worked with. Do we know? Have they traced it back to a particular yes. person? Do we know? Yeah, I think so. But I don't want to say because... Um... Oh, boo! <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I, think, I think it's something one, one can look up if you need to. Okay, I, don't, I don't want to say it on air. <laughs> and it may be unfair anyway. It's there. It's very subjective. Mm. But it was just a, a sort of another facet of Osborne using his immense literary skills to give people the chance to express themselves. Mm. And it, whatever you want to feel about Osborne, about the issues he had, how negative he, he tended to be and so on, he was an yeah. absolutely brilliant writer. For people, again, for people who don't know him that well, so Osborne was sort of known almost as a very throwaway term, but an angry man, yeah. a, li a little angry man. Yeah. His first, well, the play that most people know about, Look Back in Anger, mm. was very much a sort of angry young mm. man. So... Do you think that's still there in this? This is quite an angry play as yes, well. Yes, yes, I, I, I think it is. But he's a, appropriating it to a very particular set of people. And like all these things, you're an interloper. They, in this, the audience are a, a, an interloper. They're listening. Mm. And there's a window in other people's world. And you take from it what you will. You take from it, if you like, the bravery of, of how brutally honest these people were being. Mm. But... My association with it is this, and it, it's a very particular yes. moment in time, that the year was 1968. Osborne's, yes, Osborne's reputation was, of course, um, blasted by Look Back in Anger. And then there were some, and this was probably about the fourth play, I think, that he'd had on in the West right, End. Okay. Not maybe on the scale of things the most successful, because I think it was much more, it was a, probably a, a more rarefied audience for it. But, but on the back of his reputation, I think it did a decent year in the West End, whatever. Mm. And the reason that I saw it was I was in my first year at drama school when you are suddenly, your world is opening up into a way of looking at acting and drama 
that you'd never even seen before. You saw plays in terms of speeches and people speechifying, and but it's the absorption of the text that you begin to get a, a sense of that what real acting is. It was only just opening up to me. And I was taught by a lovely woman who was very young then and who has been a lifelong friend, actually, but she was um, in the voice department at my drama school. What school were you at, Patricia? The London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, Lambda. And she was in the voice department, but she was also appearing in this play in the evenings. That's inspiring. Yeah. Therefore, out of a sense of, because she talked to us about it a bit, um, we went to see it. Mm. And playing the the role of Laurie, the sort of the, the central character, if you like, was Paul Schofield, mm. who was absolutely one of my heroes. Um, <laughs> If if you ask me, even now, if you know which, which actors do you most admire on screen, Paul Newman, and on the stage, um, Paul Schofield, probably over over a lifetime. The Pauls win out. Those yeah. the two Pauls exactly. And <laughs> Schofield had this extraordinary ability to be camp and loquacious, and and then <laughs> take things to this absolute level of simplicity that I had never seen in my life. Mm. And this, this moment, it was really a moment in, in the play, and it's a very, it's not a long speech, this, and you could almost say it's not a speech. It's an outpouring of thinking. Yeah, it's just an extended thought. Exactly. And I remember being riveted in my seat as this unfolded because of its very truth and simplicity. Mm. And, you know, those moments hang in the air. It was a moment of both huge admiration for Osborne's writing and huge admiration for the way in which the protagonist delivered it. Mm. I'd, I'd never really, until this moment, I don't think I've ever gone back to the actual text. I extemporized it in my head. Yeah. Because it's carried with me in, in terms of reference points, you know, in in a career yeah but so it was lovely to be brought back to it and when you said a a meaningful piece it was the first one that came to my mind the the other thing is that every role as much as is possible that one plays you want to see if you're allowed to if the character has enough presence on the stage that you see a window into their the character's soul Mm. doesn't Mm. all it isn't always allowed but if you can find it that's your connection with the audience. Yeah. And with Osborne, who was a, a brutal writer in so many ways, what this does is not just open the window into the character's soul, who would have told you, you, you might have got very tired of him by this point in the play because <laughs> of his bitchiness and his, his ability with words to sort of, you know, override you with, with his, uh, with, with his um, facility. Mm. But this gives you a window into the character's soul and most particularly into Osborne because he could not have written this unless he'd felt it and experienced it himself. Yeah, yeah. So that was, um, that was my reason for pulling this out. So what's happening at that moment? Contextually, there are three couples mm. and the couples all obviously have a dynamic between them and so on. And there is this moment on stage and it was played in, as I say, Paul Schofield and Judy Parfit played the um, the woman who is married to somebody one of the other partners and they're having a conversation in which they just happen the two of them to be left on stage together mm. alone mm. the others have all gone off to change or whatever and suddenly they are in it's it's a trip switch into Laurie confessing that he's had extramarital affairs Right. And she asks him about it seemingly dispassionately and says, mm-hmm. oh, you know, have you? And he, he says, um, yes, and open, opens up about it. And then the trip switch is, and they keep deflecting. You know, it's all very lightly put and very sort of, they're feeling the, the way. It's, it, it, it seems fairly inconsequential. Yeah. They seem both of them able to take it. Yeah. And then, I'm sorry, we'll have to, I'll have to give you both conversations, both parts of the conversation here yeah, so that yeah. you get the context. She says, I better go and change. Mm. 
and he says, um, he, he holds her back and he says, I've wanted to tell you, in other words, about what he's, he's just confessed to. Mm. And she says, have you? And he says, no one knows. You won't tell Gus, will you? And she says, I won't tell anyone. Why did you want to tell me? And he says, why? Because to me, you have always been the most dashing, romantic, friendly, playful, loving, impetuous, lucky, fearful, detached, constant woman I have ever met. And I love you. I don't know how else one says it. One shouldn't. And I've always thought you felt perhaps the same about me. And she says, I do. And he says, when we're all away, you are never out of my heart. And she says, nor you out of mine. And he says, so, there it is. It's snowing again. I wonder what it'll be like in London. Oh, and that's God. it. That's it. I wish. I mean, I think it's very dangerous, actually, to be to, to be doing it because it, it deserves much. It deserves so much more than that. But it, it is. It's one of those things, as you and I know, that there are things in place that just take a long time to really fall into where they belong. Mm. If you're pushing them, you're not doing it. You, it, it needs full, mm. full engagement. Yeah, there's a sense he's really, after each word, he thinks he's going to stop and then there's another thing he thinks he should mention. Yes, exactly. So you have this moment of confession between these two people that has nothing to do with the rest of the play and goes nowhere God. but just hangs in the middle there. And you could have heard everybody's heart in the theatre. <laughs> I bet. But but you you would need to really earn the pauses in it and so on. And what what a difficult challenge, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a difficult challenge when an actor was fully immersed. I love what you said that that it doesn't feature in the plot in anywhere else. Yeah. I get very frustrated in films or plays when I can tell that everything that's in there is in there for a reason and as a result I can never let anything the realism of anything just wash over me yeah. because every time something happens I think that's obviously going to have a relevance later or something you know I, I love the idea that this is real real life exactly. you know where things are said or things do occur that don't get followed up on they appear inconsequential but of course they're highly consequential yeah it's the most brilliant it's it, it's so daring of the playwright and particularly then, you know, when new ways of writing were only re uh, really... He, he was such a frontier man. I mean, of course, Harold Pinter was as well. The, the, these were titans of, 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 of our age. When you say as well about it being a bit of a... What was the word you used? But, you know, like a keyhole, an eye, a, a window into his soul. A window into the soul, that yeah. It immediately reminded me of that famous monologue in Sarah Kane's Crave where she talks, where a character sort of talks about all the things they want to do with the person they love. But it's funny because I think that does have, that does have an anger to it. Mm. You see that in the list in Sarah mm. Kane's. It's full of beauty, but it's also full of knotty, thorny, slightly ugly sides of love. Whereas this is just pure, yeah. selfless, idolatry. And at the end of it, just, just to say it and to let her know what his feelings are. And if you have got the weight of what this character is like, the rest of it, you would never think that it was possible yeah. to come out of this man. And I think it's, um, it, it, it's such a wonderful thing to know about humanity and to remember how deep people's souls are. When you looked back at it, because you said you bought a copy just to chat to me about, yeah. did you go, oh, I didn't remember it exactly being that way? I tell you, I tell you what, I felt... 
that it was longer yeah. than when I came to it. it. I mean, it couldn't be any longer because there's enough superlatives in there. Yeah. But it was an expanded moment. Mm. And my memory of it in the expansion was longer than actually it appears on the page. And therefore, it took me a while to find it in the, um, in the script. Because I, I was looking for a bigger for a block of... Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I do recall exactly how they were sitting on the stage. Mm -hmm. And um, it was... I think there were three sofas, or if not, there were chairs and there was a sofa. And, but they were sitting absolutely... They were quite a way away from each other. Amazing, yeah. There was nothing intimate about their body language. They were sitting as if they're two people in the foyer of a hotel <laughs> having a conversation about going to Bloomingdale's. Well, of course, it wasn't Bloom but You know what I mean? It was Amsterdam. But, uh, and in the way that he goes on and talks about the snow outside. Yeah. It is not heralded in any way at all, but it stops you in your tracks. It's interesting that um, it's a play that not many people... No. Well, no, it was revived at the Donmar uh, in the early 2000s. Good old Michael Billington had said in his review that it was the, the John Osborne play that time forgot. It's obviously completely yes. gone under the radar now. Yeah, I think it, 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 everything has its, its time there. They may just feel that it's too rarefied. They, it would not have enough social re relevance to today that's that's the trouble but that's such a shame I, I feel like I've been more aware of that in my years producing rather than acting but the awareness of any time I stumble across a play that I love and my company have wanted to produce I find myself having to find the angle and that feels very sad because sometimes there isn't an angle it's just great entertainment absolutely and it makes you feel something I sort of I do find that quite hard about our industry that mm. there's often a there's often a desire to find a relevance to latch your PR onto when actually there's all kinds of plays that we'd all get a real kick out of whether they were relevant to what's going on in the world or not. Oh, it's it's the it's the examination of the human condition mm. that is timeless. Yeah, and everything you, you take for a classic example of this is um, the play After the Dance that the Terence Oh yes, Rattigan. yeah. Which, uh, because it came on the heels of such huge successes he'd had, right? They just dismissed it at the time. It just did not hit whatever context that reviewers or or the public wanted at the time. It was not quite there. Mm. And then that revival of it at the National a few years ago for the for the centenary mm. was just one of the most wonderful things I'd ever seen. I mean, it's a fabulous production, but you just think, how can this have been? judged in that way when it's about humanity it's the, the yes. observation was so brilliant it doesn't matter what the context is when you're learning about human human beings no absolutely so there may be um a brave soul who an opportunity it, to do it again yeah i mean your brother will be a yeah good person well to actually this. i was just thinking that that Simon directed a bunch of things at a sort of pop-up space called Found 111 a few years ago. And actually the first play that they did there was something he'd been trying to get off the ground for a long time called The Dazzle by Richard Greenberg. It's, it's a story, it's sort of a fictionalisation of two brothers who did exist in New York in the 20s and who were hoarders and ultimately died in their home. And there is a rumour that, you know, they basically got crushed under all of their stuff. And it's actually just sort of fictionalising what their lives might have been. And it had no relevance to the time, but it was such an amazing story of love, yeah. of love between brothers. It was a story of kindness, basically. And it was utterly, utterly heartbreaking and brilliant, and joyful and heartbreaking in equal measure. And actually, there's another play by that writer called The Violet Hour that I've always been desperate to produce. But again, I've always struggled, you know, to know that or to persuade people that it would have the selling factor. Yeah. Whereas, like you say, yeah. it's the sort of, fragility of people or just the human experience it's all the things that go on whatever time you're in and whether you're going through coronavirus or world war ii or a mundane time it's like all these things are happening and it's the it's the connection between the characters that yeah that makes it at work and um good writing is good writing this has been fabulous thank you so much patricia no no thank you thank you for asking me. oh it's my absolute delight Hear Me Out is a Lucy Eaton Productions podcast. Music composed by Tristram Kay and artwork by Rebecca Bright. If you've enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe. And I know it's a mini faff, but if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, a rating and a review would mean the world. Finally, you can find us on social media at Pod Hear Me Out. 
And we're on YouTube, where you can catch visual clips of the show. Right, that's it. Lucy Eaton, exiting stage left. Thank you.